Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Peace Radicals podcast. My name is Mark Victor. I am an attorney with the Attorneys for Freedom law firm. And uh, if you are a regular viewer of this podcast, you'll notice someone is missing. Uh, Andy Markintel is off this week, so I get to run the show and talk about whatever I want. And as we often do at the beginning of the show, I want to talk a little bit about why we're doing this. Why are we doing this Peace Radicals podcast? Well, it's uh, not just for the fun of doing a podcast, but Peace Radicals supports a much larger project called the Live and Let Live Movement. And if you're hearing about it for the first time, you can check it out at liveandletlive.org. And if you are hearing about it right now, you're hearing about it very early because the movement hasn't launched yet. This is a global peace movement that is being put together very carefully, very professionally by lots of people around the world in many different countries. And uh, there are chapters forming right now. But because this is a very serious effort to improve, radically improve and change the world, it needs to be done right, needs to be done in a comprehensive kind of way, in a professional kind of way. And so the scheduled launch for the movement right now is March of 2023, where we are expecting to have a really huge event in Honolulu, Hawaii, which is going to be the real kickoff of the Live and Let Live movement. So if you haven't heard about the Live and Let Live movement, you're probably scratching your head and saying, what the heck is Live and Let Live? Well, let me tell you what I know already. You probably like that phrase, live and let live, right? I mean, most people just intuitively, you know, if I say to the average person on the street, look, I'm just for live and let live, I can tell you the vast majority of people will respond with, yeah, me too. This kind of makes sense. The question is, can we build a peace movement? Can we build a civilized society around this one principle? Because sure, it's easy to say, yeah, I agree with live and let live, but what the heck does that mean? Well, you got to put some definition on that. And um, the people in the Live and Let Live movement have, we've sort of thought about this. And one thing we know is not consistent with Live and Let Live is being an aggressor, right? If you're hitting somebody over the head, if you're an initiator of force, you are definitely not living consistently with the idea of Live and Let Live. So if there's one major rule here, it's don't be an aggressor. Well, then, you know, of course, you got to figure out what's an aggressor and uh, the live and let live movement takes the position that an aggressor is somebody who initiates force now let me just pause on that for a second initiates force this doesn't mean self-defense is out right if you could respond you have a right to defend yourself you're not initiating force you're using force defensively that's perfectly fine that's not violating the live and let live rule. But if you're an initiator of force, you are definitely violating the live and let live rule. Also, fraud. If you're engaging in fraud, you're violating the live and let live rule. And also coercion. These are things that really overcome another person's will. It violates another person's right to be in charge of their own body, property, money, and time. They're in charge of that. Everybody has equal rights to be in charge of themselves. Of course, I'm talking about competent adults here. And then for the more sophisticated of you out there listening to this show, you also will know there's another category of things that violates the live and let live rule. We like to refer to these as substantial risks. You don't get to do things that create big risks of harm to other people. What am I talking about here? You know, things like drunk driving. If you're so drunk, you're driving down the road. You haven't initiated force yet, but you're creating a huge risk of that. Maybe you're on the wrong side of the road or something like that. Okay, we don't have to wait until you cause a car accident. You're creating a substantial risk right now. There are many such substantial risks, right? Imagine if your neighbor has decided, you know, I'm going to experiment with deadly viruses in my basement and have my eight-year-old son uh, keep an eye on it to make sure that no viruses escape from the basement. Okay, this is reckless activity, right? This is the kind of thing that endangers people in a very substantial kind of way, just like the rule on self-defense, right? If you're a believer in self-defense, you already agree with this concept. You don't have to wait until somebody, somebody's fist connects with your face before you are able, legally speaking, to actually use self-defense. You can do that at the point 
another person is creating a substantial and imminent risk, right? Somebody's got their fist back and they're getting ready to hit you. You don't have to wait till they hit you. You can hit them. Why? Because they're creating a substantial risk. So what we're saying with the Live and Let Live movement is nobody should ever be allowed to violate the Live and Let Live rule. And indeed, the law ought to absolutely prohibit all violations of the live and let live rule. Nobody gets to be an aggressor. And this applies to everybody. I don't care what color your skin is or where you were born or if you're fat or thin or rich or poor or what holidays you celebrate, what foods you eat, what you, what you believe about religion. Or, none of this stuff matters. Everybody should be treated exactly the same way. And very importantly to note here is that this applies to everybody even if they form a group, right? Imagine if a few of us get together and say, now we've got a group. But do you think the group ought to be able to violate the live and let live rule? We in the live and let live movement say, no, just because you formed a group doesn't mean you get to violate the rule. And even if you formed a big group, and so if it's a big organization or something like that, even if it's one of those corporations, for lots of my friends on the left who don't like corporations, look, we are saying in the live and let live movement, this rule applies to corporations exactly the same way as it applies to individuals. Corporations don't get to initiate force or engage in fraud or engage in coercion or do things that put us at substantial risks of harm. So they, they absolutely should be treated the same way. And the same can be said about the biggest group of all, the government, just because uh, many people have gotten together and formed a government doesn't mean that the government should be allowed to violate the rule. And if you think about it, why would we want the government to violate the rule? Do we really want the government out there initiating force or fraud or coercion or creating substantial risks to us? No, that's not the role of government. The role of government is to protect our rights so we can be in charge of our own body, money, property, in time. So that's about half of what the Live and Let Live movement is about. And the half I'm talking about is the legal half. What we're saying in Live and Let Live is the laws should all be calibrated around what I just explained, which what, what we call the Live and Let Live principle. And that's a legal matter. Those are legal questions. That's what we lawyers deal with. But there's also important ethical matters that we push in the live and let live movement. And that's because the live and let live movement isn't just about freedom. It's about peace and peace requires something else, something in addition. And so some of the, what we call aspirational values that are part of the live and let live movement are things like open-mindedness and tolerance and voluntary kindness and civility and building high levels of trust with other people in justice in ultimately increasing human happiness while decreasing human suffering. These are the aspirational values. And any time I talk about them, the very first thing out of my mouth is that we would oppose anybody who wanted to put these aspirational values into the law. So if you wanted to pass a law that said everybody's got to be open-minded or tolerant or civilized or voluntarily kind towards other people, we would oppose it because it's very important to understand the difference between an ethics question, which is what the aspirational values are about, the ethical realm, if you will, and the legal realm. The legal realm is just about, did you violate the principle? So if you can get clear in your head that you could take a position against, let's just say, for example, prostitution, you might decide, you know, prostitution is immoral. And I think people shouldn't do it, and it's a sin, and I would discourage it and try to talk people out of doing it. But at the same time, you could take the position that prostitution ought to be completely legal between consenting adults, of course, so long as there's no force or fraud or coercion involved, then the rule isn't violent. If you can understand the difference, what I just explained between a moral question, say about prostitution and a legal question about the same prostitution and understand that somebody who holds prostitution is immoral, but should still be legal is actually being consistent here. This is somebody who understands the difference between these two realms. 
you are on your way to be what we like to call a live and let liver. So if this makes sense to you, and I hope it does, because I think it makes sense to all reasonable people. Live and let live is about reasonable people. If you don't agree that being an aggressor is wrong, then I would say to you, you're not reasonable. You can't be reasoned with, right? Reason is a, we use conversation to convince people on re, about reason. If you want to use force, well, you're a thug and you are unreasonable. So I'm not talking to you. This movement isn't for you. But I would encourage the reasonable people of the world to check out liveandletlive.org. Um, if you desire, you want to be part of the solution instead of part of the problem, join the Live and Let Live movement. All right, so there's my little primer on the Live and Let Live movement. And I want to very uh, quickly get to my guest, an old friend of mine, uh, someone I haven't seen in a long time, and COVID's happened, but a, a true uh, man of peace and a what I'll call a, an activist for uh, freedom and uh, this is economist Don Bordreau. Uh, Don, why don't you say hello and introduce yourself to uh, our listeners? Hey, Mark. It's I'm very happy to be here. I I love your live and let live philosophy. It's one that I've tried to live by myself for for decades. I agree with every word every word that you say, and I endorse every word that you you say. So I, I'm Don Boudreau. I'm an economist. I teach economics at George Mason University. I'm a former chairman of the department here. Um, my passion is teaching uh, basic economics to the general public. Um, and so when I when I teach at George Mason, I most I choose. I mostly teach 18 year olds because I think that's where the best economics education is is done. I don't teach a whole lot of graduate students. They're they're already They've already learned anything I can possibly teach them. I agree with everything that Mark says. Uh, I spend all of my uh, intellectual energies when I'm not teaching students trying to figure out, trying to determine ways to explain to the general public the good sense of what Mark calls the live and let live philosophy. I, 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 I like that term a lot. Uh, I consider myself to be a a a, a classical liberal slash libertarian. I uh, I came of age of when uh, Milton Friedman was just gaining popularity. Uh, uh, so in the late 1970s, and and then so Milton Friedman has a, P, a PBS special, and then a few years so Ronald Reagan gets elected president. He's talking about free markets. A few years later, the Berlin Wall comes down. A few years after that, the Soviet Union's ended. Everything seems honky dory, um, end of history, and all that, and, and 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 here we are, 2021, and things don't look so rosy. I do think that we humans uh, have to constantly struggle to maintain a society of civility and cooperation and peace against what I come increasingly to believe are our natural instincts of tribalism or bandism uh, and, 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 and to think of society as a zero sum or negative sum struggle. It's not if, if, if we have the right institutions, if, if we have live and let live institutions. But it's, it's, it's very difficult when government is in charge because there's a, very, there's a strong temptation of those persons who can gain access to the levers of government to use those levers of coercion in order to turn uh, the, the, the mechanisms of coercion to their own benefits at the expense of the general public. And that's something we have to constantly be on guard against. And uh, as I'm sure Mark and I will discuss in the next, in the next several minutes, um, some of the most recent events of the past year and, and maybe the past decade uh, that have worked against the live and let live principle. Mark gave me, before we went on air, the opportunity to tell you where you can reach me. So the main thing I do, other than teach economics at George Mason, and I'm a senior fellow at the at George Mason's Mercatus Center, and I'm the Getchell Chair for the study of free market economics there. Um, but I also blog uh, uh, daily at a blog called Cafe Hayek, C-A-F-A, uh, C-A-F-E, H-A-Y-E-K dot com, named after my great hero, the Nobel Prize winning economist, F.A. Hayek, 
Uh, so if you if you're interested in anything I have to say, you can go. You can find the stuff that I, most of all that I do at at the blog Cafe Hyatt dot com. So let me turn it back to Mark and uh, just let's just have a great conversation. Man. Yeah, I I want to um I want to give a little grief to the economists of the world for a moment. But before I before I say that, I, I'm going to ask you maybe to defend your fellow economists here. But before I say that, I want to be clear about something because. Really, what I care about, and I think what we care about in the Live and Let Live movement, is what I said at the beginning, that the rule isn't violated. So we don't have to take a position about capitalism versus socialism. We just say, look, do whatever you want. Just don't violate the rule. And so as this applies to capitalism, uh, a lot of people... Re, they sort of ding capitalism, but what they're really talking about is crony capitalism, right? So yeah. free market, uh, if it's truly a free market exchange, right? Competent adults exchanging goods or services and there's no fraud or coercion or anything like that. Well, the rule isn't violated, so they should be yeah. able to trade as much as they like. Crony, or as little as they like. Yeah. Or as little yeah. as like, or not at all, right? The right to trade right. also includes the right not to trade for any reason right. at all, as long as they're if not... You want to be a, if you want to be a hermit, that's your business. If you're, free to, you're free to be a hermit. Yeah. We're in total agreement here. But crony capitalism, which takes a lot of heat, I think uh, justifiably so, is uh, generally a situation where you have a lobbyist or a lobby group maybe who donates money to a politician uh, in exchange for some type of a law that gives an, a market advantage usually to that company or corporation over their competitors or, or some uh, license to do something. This involves force, right? Because what yep. you're saying is, look, we're, we'll give you the license. You can go do the job, but other people, we're not going to give them the license. So this violates the rule. For that reason and that reason only, crony capitalism is out. So all the attacks on capitalism that are actually crony capitalism, we're in total agreement here. Are we not, Don? Yeah. yeah. I, look, the, 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 that horse has already left the gate. I don't like the term crony capitalism. I use it, but it's not really capitalism. No. It's just cronyism. Yes. And so tariffs, occupational licensing, subsidies, these are all examples of activities that have nothing to do with voluntary consent. Each of them is based on coercion. Yep. A tariff is, so I'm a trade economist. That's my specialty as an economist. A tariff is the government putting a gun in the face, or threatening to put a gun in the face of fellow citizens saying, if you choose to buy something made abroad and not pay the special tax, we will put you in a cage. And if you resist the cage, we'll shoot you. Right. And so, of course, most people don't want to be put in a cage. And so they're willing to they, 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 rather than pay the extra tax, they say, well, I'm not going to pay the extra tax. I'm instead going to buy the domestically produced substitute product, which is the point of the of the tariff. Right. I, I do not see why I'm an American. I'm proud to be an American. I really am. Me, too. I do, Me too. I too. I do, I do not see why any producer based in America has any more right to my income, how I choose to spend my income, than a producer anywhere else. If I choose, it's my income, I earned it. If I choose to spend my income buying something made in China, made in Chile, made in Uruguay, made in Germany, that's my business. And so if the government imposes a tariff saying, no, 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 if, if you choose to buy something made in China, you gotta pay this special tax, that's coercion. coercion. Imposed against me for the benefit of another American. I do not see why that other American is more worthy than I am. I am willing to let that other American do as he or she sees fit, but unfortunately that other American is not willing to let me do as I see fit. And so so I, I oppose all forms of using coercion to obstruct what Robert knows it called consenting capitalist acts among adults. So this is an easy one for the person who's easy, very easy. I- interested in the live and let live movement, because we said right from the beginning, coercion violates the rule. And you've explained very eloquently that uh, tariffs uh, are coercion and it's a form of coercion. And so uh, they violate the rule. So cronyism or crony capitalism, whatever you prefer, is out. Easy. Right. But, but, but what people will say, Mark, people will say, oh, yeah, but but when, 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 if you choose to buy something from abroad, that means you're not choosing to buy something domestically, and, and and that hurts your fellow Americans because it reduces the profits of those companies and it reduces 
uh, employment in those companies. And, and my response is, I, I have I haven't signed up to have any responsibility of employing those people. If I voluntarily choose to buy from a fellow American, that's that's my business, and, and congratulations to them, they've won my business. But if I choose to buy something from an American, I don't thereby sign up to continue to buy from them for as long as I live. And they are entitled to my patronage only for as long as they can keep my patronage. Now, the economists will point out that, that in fact, when I choose to buy something from abroad and spend my dollars abroad, that those dollars will come back to America as demand for American exports or as investments in America, which will create jobs elsewhere in America. And I think all oh, that's fine. That's the economic argument. But 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 and, and, and although I enjoy making it because I'm an economics professor, I actually must say, I, I, I wish I didn't have to make that argument. I think the argument ends at you have no right to my income. That's right. Period. That's right. <laughs> I, I can spend my if I earn my income fairly, I can spend my income wherever the hell I choose. And, I, and, and I'm not obliged to spend it buying a good from an American if I choose instead to peacefully spend it buying a good from from abroad. And that's and, and ethically for me, that's the end of the story. That's all I have to know. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. As it turns out, just by happenstance, this actually is a good thing for America, right? Because as you pointed out, people in foreign countries, if they become rich, they have more ability to buy goods from us here in the United States. And if I can buy something abroad less expensive, well, that leaves me more money left over to buy something else. And it, and also, it ferments competition. Because if that yes, company in the U.S. wanted the business, build a better product at a better price. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a happy coincidence. Maybe it's actually not a coincidence, but we can call it yeah. a coincidence for the purpose. It's a happy coincidence that freedom to trade corresponds with promotion of economic growth and, and economic efficiency. Um, and given the given your main effort, Mark, uh, let me let me point out that there's also a strong body of evidence, and it makes sense when you think about it, that freedom to trade also corresponds to peace. Mm-hmm. Um, 175 years ago this month, on June 25th, 1846, the British Parliament repealed the Corn Laws. Now, most people don't know what that is, but this was a major move in Britain to turn that country from a protectionist country into a completely free trade co- country. It remained a free trade country from the middle of the, 18th, of the 19th century until 1931. And one of the main arguments given by uh, Richard Cobden and other proponents of of repealing these protectionist pieces of legislation was that uh, free trade promotes peace. So when people are are allowed to trade with each other, not only do they become, they get to know each other better, right? But, but at at, at a purely um, uh, utilitarian level, you become more dependent on each other. And it's just a good rule of business. Don't shoot your customers. That's right. Don't shoot your suppliers. Yeah. And we have evidence that the more integrated economically countries are, the less likely, it doesn't go down to zero, of course, but the less likely they are to get into shooting wars with each other. So not 80 years ago, we got into a shooting war with Japan. It's inconceivable now that we'll get into a shooting war with Japan. Right. Because they don't want to kill us. We buy their Toyotas. We don't want to kill them. They sell us their Toyotas and Hondas. And this is a great thing. Yes. This is this to me is the greatest benefit of free trade. Yes, it increases our living standards. It raises our real wages. It increases the variety of goods. It, it promotes innovation and competition. That's all great, right? But it merges us into a whole society. We become more like the Japanese. The Japanese become more like us. We become more interested in cooperating with them. We gain by trading rather than by raiding. I, I didn't make that phrase up. I stole it. But but there is no greater force in, in, we know in human history, I believe this sincerely to my marrow, there's no greater force for promoting peace among nations than free trade. And to the extent that free trade is thwarted, you increase the prospects of a shooting war. To the extent that free trade is promoted, you decrease those prospects. It's an excellent point. Ronald Reagan used to talk about peace through trade, and it made a lot yeah. of sense for exactly the same reasons. But we need to talk about socialism. Let me just say, 
I don't have any problem with socialism so long as I don't have any problem with anything so long as it doesn't violate the rule. So if what, you choose to live in a, in, in a voluntary kibbutz, that's your business. I won't try to stop. You. Absolutely. You have every right uh, to put your money together or a portion of, or all of it, whatever you choose with other consenting adults and put it in a sort of general fund and then pay whatever you guys decide to pay out of that fund. Who am I to tell another person that they can't do that? In fact, I, as I say to some of my socialist friends who might be voluntary socialists, if you put some kind of a nice deal together, tell me about it. If it's a really good deal, maybe I'll consider joining it. I have no problem with that. For one and one reason alone, it doesn't violate the rule we discussed. But then there's involuntary socialism, right? The idea that uh, the same exact thing, but where somebody says, you know, uh, we're going to drag other people into this arrangement. Well, for that reason alone, I don't have to talk about economic theory. I don't need a PhD in economics to simply say, look, I'm a live and let liver and uh, initiation of force or fraud or coercion violates the rule. And so people can do whatever they want. But if what they're doing is grabbing people outside of their arrangement, and forcing them to contribute their money, then that violates the rule. And so uh, involuntary socialism is out. Does this make sense to you, Don? Absolutely. I have have two points. One of my my favorite Americans, some of most of your, or many of your listeners will have heard of this, is H.L. Mencken. Yeah. And and I forget the exact quotation, but H.L. Mencken at one point, he was was a very famous American journalist in the early part of the 20th century. And he said, again, this is, this is not an exact quotation, but something like this. He had a much better way with words than I do. Uh, but he said, uh, uh, a- 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 any person whose ideas have to be uh, imposed by government is a person whose ideas aren't worth a damn. Absolutely. If, you're a go- if you have a really good idea, people will voluntarily follow your idea. Yep. If, if, if you have to pull out a gun to compel someone, to follow your idea. There's something wrong with your idea. That's There's right. not anything wrong with the person. Yep. There's something wrong with your idea. Yeah, so said another um, way, if your socialism can't work unless you drag people into it, there's a problem with what you're doing. That's right. It's pro- it's, it almost certainly is not going to work. And the second thing I want to say is, you know, we so uh, we, we, we live in a society, we're, we're, we have a, a lot of very familiar socialists, sh- socialist institutions they're called families right yeah. every one of us grew up in a family that's right right and so uh uh when, when when my son was young uh my wife and i didn't you know uh compel him to buy his food from us right we we it was a socialist arrangement we, yeah. we didn't it was, and, and it, that's how it should be in families it's how it should be among friends when friends get together they don't engage in arm's length market exchange you wouldn't want to be friends with someone like that right right but in this in, in the in, in what hayek called the great society the extended society where we are dependent upon the the creative efforts and inputs of millions of strangers we can't depend upon them uh we can't depend upon their love we have to depend upon them to rely upon their self-interest and so in those cases we offer them bargains we offer them voluntary deals that that they are free to accept or not, and we are free to accept whatever offers uh, they give to us and to reject those offers. And so uh, we live in this, we live in a world in which we, we, we sort of navigate between two kinds of, of, of social orders. In the small group, we're very comfortable, which is the group we, we evolved in. Right? We're very comfortable with these kind of socialist arrangements. And these are voluntary. You know, these are voluntary. Um, uh, but when you go out to shop, uh, Walmart doesn't give you what you take from Walmart because you're, you're, you're Sam Walton's relative and the Waltons love you. It's because you offer them something in return. And a lot of people don't like that, but there's no alternative. And so this, but, but, but this creates a real problem because a lot of people like that sort of small group, small band, uh, uh, affection, and I get it because we're humans. We all grew up in that. We all understand we like to be loved and 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 and, and, and treasured for who we are, rather than for what we have to give in terms of m- money and commercial uh, exchanges. But if we're going to enjoy 
the kind of material prosperity that we have, and make no mistake, the kind of material prosperity that ordinary Americans have today, I'm not middle class American, I'm talking about Jeff Bezos, I'm talking about you, me, people who work at steel mills in, in Youngstown, Ohio, and, 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 and just outside of Dallas, Texas. These people have a living, a material standard of living that is off the charts high. I believe actually a fair case can be made that, the, that the, a middle-class American today, in 2021, is materially richer than was John D. Rockefeller in 1921, wow. when John D. Rockefeller was the richest human being in the world. I think the, an ordinary American is richer today than was the richest person in the world just 100 years ago. Wow. Be a strong case. Yeah, I think you can make a good case. The way I, I like to express what I think is the same idea is that we live better than the best kings lived yeah. just a few hundred years ago. We live fantastic. We live better Look than... Look what we're doing now. Look what we're doing now. We are talking in real time. You are on one side of the continent. I'm on the other side of the continent. We're talking in real time. This is recorded. Uh, we're using this amazing technology that we're, that we're taking for granted. Yep. Right? We're seeing each other in living color, in perfectly good audio. Right? The cost of this, the, 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 the out-of-pocket cost of this, is virtually zero. Yeah. Right. And we're ordinary Americans. Yeah. Right? Howard, so when, 50 years ago, Howard Hughes was the richest American. There's no amount of money that Howard Hughes could have paid to do what we're doing now. Yeah. And all this because of capitalism, right? Because of companies like Zoom who are acting in their yeah. self-interest to try to produce a product that people want at a good price, not because they're trying to necessarily improve the world. That's a byproduct of what they're doing, but they're pursuing their own interest, but they don't get to violate the rule, and this is the result. So a different ways to say your live and let live principle, I tell this to my students, is one of the great benefits of a liberal society, what I call a liberal society, yeah. By liberal, I mean liberal classical, classical liberal. sense of the term, right? Or you know, a, a free market society is every individual has an absolute veto power. Right? So no one gets to do to me anything that I do not let them do to me. I have the power always to say no. You want to buy my pair of socks? No. And so if they someone wants to sell me a pair of socks, they had better make that pair of socks a, a, a bargain to me. I, the price is good. The quality is high enough. And as long as everyone can say no, it's a simple two-letter word, as long as everyone can say no, that compels all the rest of us to be attentive to the needs of others, to try to get into the heads of others. What does that person want? How can I better serve that person? And so the ability to say no, it sounds simple. But it is an amazing ability. That's one of the great features of a free society. And when government intervenes, what it does, uh, it, it can almost always be reduced to the government taking away from us, from each individual, the right to say no. You do not have the right to say no. You must say yes to yeah. that. Um, and, 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 and so that takes away from us our human agency. That takes away from us the power to protect our well-being as adults as we see fit. It's a great point. And, you know, imagine you were just sort of starting from scratch and you were setting up a system, an economic system. Wouldn't you want to say people who produce goods and services that pe other people want at a good price that they want to pay, well, we should reward that. And people who yeah. people who yeah. don't should be, economically speaking, punished. And so now that we've established that, look, if, if you're listening or watching this podcast and you love socialism, you got no beef with me, just don't violate the rule. But what confuses me, Don, you know, we, we were both around in the 80s and we remember the Cold War. We remember capitalism, roughly capitalism, versus roughly socialism at the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union fell, be honest with me here, Don, I thought this argument was over, right? Capitalism had won. 
Uh, we, we also yeah. got to take a look at what happened in East Germany, West Germany. Look, uh, there are cultural arguments and all kinds of arguments. But imagine, take the German people, chop it in half, make one side, the East side, uh, more socialist, make the other side, the West side, more capitalist, and let's peel them apart now and see how they look. Well, I don't know if you've been over there or not, or not, but you still can look at the East Berlin side and see how horrible it looks as compared to the West Berlin side. So, so I have a story, if you don't mind me. Yeah, yeah, please, please. My, the first time I ever went to Germany, well, it was during my, uh, it was the uh, beginning of my second year of law school. So I was in law school from 1989 through 1992. And I had a friend in law school, a guy named Tom Plofgen, who was a former military guy. And he was involved with some program with the then West German government. So I'm in law school in 89, the fall of 89, all the, the Berlin Wall comes down. And so he invites me to go on some junket that he's involved with, he's involved in the U.S. military and the West German government, where they take young American professionals over to Germany. So in September of 1990, I got to go for the first time to Germany. So this is less than a year after the Berlin Wall fell. So we we, we spend some time in, in, in West Germany, and eventually we get to Berlin. This is a true story. So my, 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 actually, the only time I've ever been in Berlin, I haven't been back to Berlin since. This is September of 1990. So we're walking through West Point, uh, Checkpoint Charlie, and it's dilapidated, you know, fortunately, and I'm celebrating the fact that this thing is, 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 is dead. Uh, the group, they had us stay at a hotel on the in, in East Berlin because it was cheaper. So we're staying at what we were told was the second swankiest hotel in East Berlin. Right. And uh, so this friend of mine, Tom Plofton, who I'm traveling with, we, we, we have to leave early the next morning. And he forgot his alarm clock. I brought mine. And uh, he said, can you, he said, can you call me in the morning to wake me up? I said, sure. And he was staying in a room that had a, the number had a six in it. You'll see why this is relevant in just a moment. And so uh, I said, sure. So my alarm goes off the next morning. I'm, we're staying in this East Berlin hotel. This is September of 1990. And uh, so I, I, I try to call his room and it doesn't work. So I call the operator. She spoke English, very friendly woman, I remember. And I said, I'm trying to call room and I'm like, you know, 607. And so she's, okay, one second, sir. And, she, and I hear a lot of clicking. A lot of clicking. She comes back, and at one point she says, "I'm sorry, sir. The sixes in our ho- in, in our uh, uh, hotel telephone system aren't working this morning. <laughs> the sixes aren't working. I had to go to his room and knock. Right. Wow. So th- that's how. It, so just you know, just over thirty years ago, that's how backward uh, the communist hotel was. I'm sure as 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 different as East Berlin and West Berlin are now. If you go to a hotel in East Berlin, the sixes are working. Wow! But that's how backwards yeah. socialism. Right. Was. I mean, there's countless examples here. Right. The cars that came out of the East Side versus the, the... <laughs> right, yeah. right. The Trabant. So on the same trip, I met a West German um, who was was complaining about the Trabants. He said, "Yeah, this guy lived in West Germany." He said. Uh, yeah, he says, I don't like those Trabants. He said, you know, they're getting on the Autobahns. He said, just a few days ago, my girlfriend and I are driving along. It's nighttime. And, you know, we're on the West German Autobahn. And I see this flick, these flickering lights. Fortunately, I slammed on my brakes. And so it, it explains that there was a Trabant, which like hit, they could like go a maximum of 60 miles an hour. They're basically <laughs> uh, lawnmower motors with a body. And the Trabant, had candles as taillights. Uh. The taillights stopped working. So the drivers in East Germany got accustomed to lighting candles. Wow. <laughs> That's how primitive communism is. It's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, even if you ignore all of that, there are countless examples. Of, look at South Korea in North Korea. Which one has light. Yeah, which one has a better economic system? You can see at night, as as we all know, right? Uh, how did Hong Kong get the way to have such a high standard of living? How did Singapore get to have such a high standard of living? So what I'm getting at here, Don, is what the heck is going on in the economics classes and, and across our country and really the world that now here we are. 
Greece has fallen under the weight of its own debt. Italy is going to fall under the weight of its own debt. We keep increasing the weight of our own debt. And yet people are marching in the streets saying we want the government to pay for higher education and all of health care and who knows what else. What's gone wrong in our educational? What are you finding when you talk to your students about capitalism and socialism? What is the attraction to socialism and why can't we seem to straighten this out? So that's a big question, Mark, as, as you know, and I don't think there's any one answer to it. I'll just throw out a couple. One is I, I do think that Milton Friedman was correct. Uh, and I, I see it more and more. Milton Friedman is correct that a, 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 a germinal problem with our society is government control of K through 12 education. Yeah. It's not so much the content of what is taught there, although that's bad enough. But it's the fact that those students are not taught to think. Yeah. So I teach at George Mason University. It's a big state university in, in, in Virginia. And so most of my students, a lot of my students come from the Fairfax County Public Schools, which I'm told are some of the best public schools in the country. Right. And I got I mean, some of these students are very, very good. They got to say, I'm not impressed. Right. They, they, it's not that they're stupid. They just, I can tell they just haven't been taught to think critically. Right. It's not that their brains have been filled with mush. Their brains just haven't been trained to operate as brains. Right. They they get no classes in critical thinking. They get nothing in philosophy. Most of oh. them haven't had an economics class. They get yeah. citizenship classes. Why you should be a good be a good servant to the government, right? Yeah. So the K through twelve education is education is ruining the minds of. Of, of younger generations. I think it's getting worse. It's just getting worse as time goes on. One potential bright lining around this entire COVID cloud of lockdowns is that I think the public, the government school teachers have shown themselves to be so incompetent, unwilling to work that, that maybe, just maybe, there'll be a major movement away from government schooling. We can keep our fingers crossed that that will happen. The second thing I want to add, though, is a criticism of my own fellow economists. Um, too many of us, not myself and my colleagues at George Mason, we're an unusual bunch, but too many of my fellow professional economists, we, 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 we have come to uh, uh, arrogantly, mistakenly fancy ourselves as social engineers. That we, that the, the press comes to us and says, what, what can we do to improve society? And so we say, oh, well, do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, my answer is, I don't have any grand schemes. My my answer is, if you want to improve society, let people be free. Yeah. When you let people be free, they will notice what are the problems that are most in need of attending to, and then they will creatively experiment with different ways to deal with those problems, and the experiments that happen to be best will prove themselves in practice. I'm not intelligent enough to know ahead of time the way to do these things. That's what economists taught 100 years ago. That's not what most economists teach today. Yeah. Econ most, most of my fellow economists, I'm, I'm, I, I'm embarrassed to say, again, not at George Mason, but outside of George most of my fellow economists fancy themselves as being social engineers, as having some kind of scheme for ordering society about. Any economist who tells you what society should do beyond simply laissez-faire is someone you should not trust. That person has no earthly idea what he or she is saying. So I'm very disgusted with the K through 12 education system, and I'm even more disgusted with most of my fellow economists. So how worried are you, Don, about what's going on in our country right now? Mostly uh, economics type of a question, but if you want to go beyond that and get into other things, then feel free. So Mark, I do a lot of public lectures. I'm sure, you've, yep. I'm, I'm sure some of the lectures that you've seen me do are one of these. I'm, I've generally been very optimistic about the future. Um, but in the past year has basically turned me into a huge pessimist. I, I, I see it. I don't think it's because I'm get, I mean, I've been getting older all my life. Um, uh, the whole COVID experience for me has been eye opening. I was and remain and i'm not I, and you and i have, haven't spoken about this so i'm not sure how you feel about this but here's my opinion i am shocked and dismayed at the sheepishness with which our fellow americans 
not just our fellow Americans, but our fellow human beings around the world, have submitted themselves to what I call the COVIDocracy. We've had this virus, which for many people is more dangerous than normal, but not for everyone. But people have allowed themselves to be frightened to a degree that I think is utterly disproportionate to the underlying risk. And in line with that, as a result of that, have allowed themselves, and in some cases have, have positively demanded that government lock them down, rule them, put mandates on them. And when I saw the degree to which society rolled over and allowed the COVIDocracy, the, the public health bureaucrats to just issue these rules that came out of nowhere uh, and, 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 and we obeyed them, most, most, m- most of us, most people, not me, but most people. I, I am very pessimistic. I think, it, I think it portends very poorly for the future. I'm really worried. So even though we're kind of now, the COVID thing is kind of easing a little bit, I worry that the next pathogen that comes along that's mildly more dangerous than the normal flu, we're going to repeat the whole process. And so uh, uh, the past year has dramatically transform my opinion from one of general optimism to one of deep pessimism. Well, I want to get I back I'm wrong. Yeah, I think you're wrong. And I want to get back to you on that point and see if I, I can get so. you back on the optimism train. But before I do that, um, I want to touch on a more pessimism here. Uh, I, I'm very worried about a different problem that I think feeds the problem you're talking about, which is our inability to converge on facts. So, well, yeah. if, for example, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, and if you watch that during the pandemic, well, you believe, uh, you know, we're all going to die. The, the risk here is really tremendous. If you watch, say, Fox uh, or some of the other uh, more right wing side media, you think something between this thing is a complete hoax Uh, to it's something close to the flu and you act accordingly. And it sounds to me that your judgment is more in line with that position. But, you know, these people who are walking around on the streets after having been vaccinated by themselves, wearing a mask outside over their nose and mouth, I don't think they're doing this because they enjoy wearing a mask. They're doing this because what they believe about how you can contract coronavirus and what it would likely do to you if you do is something radically different than what you believe. And I'm not so sure how we fix this problem because this isn't just a problem that applies to coronavirus. Take, for example, uh, global warming. What you believe, yeah, it's the same, absolutely same, same problem. Thing. What you same believe thing. here is a function of what you watch. Now, I'm, I'm not, I'm a lawyer. I do criminal defense for a living. I'm not in a position to judge how, you know, the, the dangers of this virus or any particular virus. I, I know and I worry because of synthetic biology coming that soon bad guys with bad intentions will be intentionally creating viruses that will make this situation look like truly the common cold. And when that, could, that, that could be. That, so so, so I, 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 I think we're agreed, actually. So my, my, my complaint is that there was there was early on, like from from places like the CDC, even the WHO, right, there was available data that should have caused any sensible person. I'm not talking about Fox. I don't look at Fox. I really I don't look at Fox. I've never I haven't looked at Fox in years. Right? I know who Tucker Carlson is, but I've never. I, I honestly don't know what I read headlines. I'm looking at data, right and this disease is it kills overwhelmingly people who are 85 and old. Right? The risk to people who are below 50 is virtually zero. Right? It's not zero, but the risk to no one is zero for anything. And so what 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 I can restate my my pessimism in that so many Americans listen to the mainstream media and the the, the politicians in power, both under Trump and under Biden, who were peddling narratives that were utterly, in my view, utterly inconsistent with the underlying reality. And rather than 
on their own explore for what is the underlying truth, they were willing to have their lives utterly disrupted with arbitrary, unprecedented powers. I find that to be really distressing. Yeah, I agree with you because it turned out the way it turned out. And of course, at the beginning, I cut him a little more slack, don't you? At the beginning, we don't know what's coming. We don't know what the data is. We got to be cautious, right? So we're in March, early April of 2020. Yes, of course, right? Uh, But it it, it wasn't long after that. I, I became obsessed with this pretty early on. And yeah, I'm a college professor. I have access to computers. I know how to read statistics. So I can cut people even even more slack. But certainly by the beginning of summer last year, it was known to to anyone who would look that if you were not a really old person or really sick person, this was not a particularly dangerous disease to you. It just wasn't. Maybe mildly more than the ordinary flu. But the but 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 uh, I, I like what my GMU econ colleague Brian Kaplan says about this. Let's have a proportional reaction. So yeah. if this is twice as dangerous as, as the ordinary flu, let's have a reaction that's twice as aggressive. We had this off, we had this this unprecedented, destructive uh, reaction to this disease that's still going on in a lot of places. To this day in, in, in Canada. There are border blockades where, where people from one, te- one one province in Canada can't travel to another province in Canada. In Britain, until until uh, two weeks from today, uh, assuming they stick to the timeline, it's still illegal for families to get together for certain events. It should not be. This is not this is not how a free society operates. Anyway. Um, So that made me very pessimistic. Tell me why I should be optimistic. You should be optimistic because there has never in our lifetime been a better opportunity to start something new. The people on the right are frustrated. The people on the left are frustrated. The level, the percentage of people who say, you know what, I'm ready to look at something new has never been as high as it is right now, not only in the United States, but throughout the world. We have such an incredibly good opportunity right now. And, you know, this is one of the things that um, kind of got me thinking here. I was asked to give a speech to introduce Joe Jorgensen, the Libertarian mm-hmm. Party presidential candidate. And I, I didn't expect very big turnout because, of course, this is the Libertarians and they don't get very much play. But I went to give a talk and man this was outside in a park there were literally hundreds of people there and i was so excited these are people who were didn't understandably didn't like trump and understandably didn't like biden and probably were scratching their heads saying what are these libertarians about and i listened to joe Jor- it can't be worse <laughs> right right <laughs> I listened to Joe Jorgensen, who, by the way, I, I liked very much. I think she. I under- like her too. I think. I, like her too. I think she understood the philosophy. But I had one very big criticism. She spoke for an hour and a half, and she never mentioned the one thing that makes a libertarian a libertarian, which is this um, agreement with what the libertarians call the non-aggression principle, which is the one thing when somebody live says, "Yeah," when somebody says, "I'm a libertarian," what I hear here is this person knows what the non-aggression principle is and agrees with it but she never yeah. mentioned that and so it's the in you know we can talk about why the sort of freedom movement has not gone anywhere but i think the main reason it hasn't gone anywhere is because most people don't know what the hell it is they have no idea and first of all the non-aggression principle they said what the hell does that mean I think they understand the live and let live principle. As soon as I say live and let live, they got it. And so I've been saying. I applaud you for taking that approach, Mark. I think that's, that's, that that, the non-aggression principle sounds like something that comes from your philosophy 101 course. It probably bored you stiff, right? Right. Live and let live, it it, it sounds like a play on a James Bond movie. Yes. Although the James Bond movie, of course, is a play on. Live and let die, yes. but, 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 But people get it. People get all over the world. They get it, Don. All over the world, there are ways, there are Uh, phrases in every language. Live and let live already. Right, right. And so, I I know we're getting near near the end. So let 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 me give you then, please, uh, a a reason for 
optimism. Yes. Although I, well, <laughs> so I had a I had a, a great colleague. He's a very famous economist. He he unfortunately died early a few years ago. A guy named Bob Tollison. And I was once years ago as a young economist. I was complaining to Bob about my frustration at you know I, I give talks, I write papers, I do op eds, letters to the editor, which I do a lot of, and uh, and it seems to have no effect. And and Bob in his in his droll South Carolina accent, he said, uh, Don says, don't despair. We're all part of the equilibrium. And by that, what he meant is, so however you think, however bad you think things are now, if you're putting your voice out there, uh, it's probably the case that you're having some impact and that's making things better than they would be if your voice were not out there. Yep. Yes, we want it to be better. But the fact that things aren't as ideal as you would like them does not mean that you are not having an impact. Yep. The fact, and so you're having an impact, Mark. I'm sure of it. And uh, so I, I, I urge you to keep doing. I know I don't have to urge you because I know it's it's in you to do. There's it. no <laughs> way to. There's no way to stop me, Don. I'm well, moving no, forward with uh, lots of great people around the world. I, and I invite you to join us. By the way, I I know everybody's got time commitments, but I invite you to be part of the Live and Let Live movement and help push it. And as look. I know exactly what you are about because I, I've known you for a long time and I've followed you for a long time. You're exactly the kind of person I'd love to have as one of the founders of this movement. And so I'm how, a live and let live guy. Absolutely. As much as you'd love to contribute to this, how, however you'd be willing to, we'd take as much as we can get. I only got about three hours more of things to talk to you about, <laughs> Don, but I know we're coming to the end of our time. I definitely want to have you back on again. And uh, I want to collaborate with you a little bit if we can, maybe offline and yeah. talk about because we have to succeed we don't have a choice anymore because technology is key is marching forward and smaller and smaller numbers of people are going to be able to do greater and greater amounts of harm winning this argument is no longer a luxury we have to win the argument there's a sense of urgency here if we want our species and I, and I say this understanding how big of a statement it is if we want our species to continue we have to win this argument. We have, if, yeah, we have to win it in a global if, kind of way too, because that's our new society. It's the planet Earth. Those are our brothers, yeah. and that's our community. The, if anything, if coronavirus taught us anything, it was that people over there can do things that create substantial risks to the whole world. We need to springboard this experience into a global peace movement. If the extensive globe spanning market order that exists today and upon which our literal existence depends our literal existence if, the, if this if this economy dies literally billions of us will die with it how close are we to that, Don, in your opinion? We've been hearing from economists for 30 years now. We're on the brink of a crash. But it's we just, hard to we, say, Mark. Fortunately, fortunately, the profit motive is really strong. So self-interest is really strong. So, so business people have a strong incentive to keep finding customers and keep finding suppliers and finding a way around regulatory obstructions and natural obstructions. Fortunately, it's really strong, but it's not. Um, so I've, I've learned as I've gotten older that the, the market order is more robust and more resilient and stronger than I thought it was 30 years ago. Uh, but it's not indestructible. And so I don't know where the breaking point is, and I don't dare guess where the breaking point is, but I also don't mind saying that there is a breaking point. And once we hit that breaking point, uh, it will be calamitous. Yeah. Now, we, each of us, each, every person within the sound of your voice and my voice right now is dependent literally upon billions of strangers from around the globe for our lifestyle. And if, if those ties, those peaceful commercial ties are broken, it's not that we're just going to lose our internet connection or that uh, our we're going to pay more for electricity or coffee. We will die. 
Uh, and uh, so we have to we have to work strongly to maintain this wonderful system of peaceful global capitalism. It's not perfect, but it's an amazing benefactor of humanity. Eloquent as always, my good friend, Professor Don Boudreaux. I want to thank you so much for coming on our podcast today, The Peace Radicals. I want to thank you for everything that you're doing and everything that you have done. Walter Block, my good friend, also an economist, uh, says there's... Uh, I know Walter very well. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, says there's uh, thousands of flowers blooming out there for freedom. And whatever you're doing, I'm sure you're working in the right direction. I- I'd love to work with you. So any anything you'd want to do together, I- open door policy. But I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. I know it's late where you are. And uh, we'll certainly be in touch. And I just want to say to all of our listeners, thanks for listening. As always... Very, very interested to hear your comments or critiques, especially critiques. Um, very, very easy to get a hold of. It's just Mark, M A R C, at attorneysforfreedom.com. All spelled out attorneysforfreedom.com. If you have a question, a comment, a criticism, something you want me to address, feel free to email me. And if it's a good question, I'm happy to air it out on the podcast. Uh, We will be back next time with another really interesting guest. And uh, until then, I just want to remind you to check out liveandletlive.org. This is attorney Mark Victor signing off. Peace.